I actually know where those spoons came from as well as the two US dollars. There's a story behind that. <laughs> maybe I'll maybe I'll tell you if I get enough of this. <laughs> Wait, look at all those people. Oh, listen to that beautiful sound. Could that possibly be the dulcet tones of Mr. Fox Amore joining me on this stage? I believe it is. <laughs> Mr. Moore joined, what was it, three, four years ago? Kind of as a lark. Actually, I think we were both falling down, throwing up on ourselves drunk. And I think we said, I got an idea. Let's have you play a piano while I'm telling stories to people. And it worked. <laughs> Somehow it worked. So I enjoy having this man up here because he provides the musical accompaniment. Because if my stories start to like suck or something, you won't notice it because you're hypnotized by the magnificent tones that come from the talented fingers, and his fingers are talented. Take it from me, of Mr. Fox. You can applaud now. <laughs> I cannot see anybody out there. All I can see is this sea of light, which is fine. I see ears. Yeah, I can see the ears too. Um, I, I let, if, if, let us hear some sort of sound. Please, not a howl. Don't do that. Um, if anybody has never seen either myself or Mr. Ramore perform before, is anybody out there who's your first time? There's a few first timers out there. Uh, in case you're not sure why you're here, some friend said, Oh, you have to go to this thing. Yeah. Basically, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm Uncle Kagi, I don't know why, but uh, I'm from America, as if you couldn't tell, and Mr. Moore is from Scotland, as if you couldn't tell. Um, thank you. <laughs> you picked up the cue, I love it. Uh, basically what happens is, uh, they call me, uh, it, the French call me a raconteur, which is stupid because I'm not a raccoon, but what I do is I get up here and I basically make noise with my face and I put the liquid contents of this glass into that same face and I continue doing that until I throw up on myself and fall down these stairs and Mr. Moore plays music. <laughs> going to happen, there will be a test at the end. <laughs> By the way, for those of you who don't know, I am a man of science. I'm a professional scientist. That's why I wear this get-up here. This is not just a costume. I wear this to work every single day. And that is Mr. Moore's work uniform. He is an undertaker. <laughs> I'm also the chairman. I, I share a common trait with Cheetah, who you all know, Cheetah, who runs this amazing convention as chairman. I share a common trait with him, and that is high blood pressure. <laughs> I am the chairman of a convention in the United States called Anthrocon. It is uh, a little bigger than this one. As a matter of fact, as far as I know, my fursuit parade is bigger than this one. <laughs> Sorry, sorry, but we're not here to compare sizes. Oh, are we? That's later. <laughs> so basically, I shall make noise of my face, Mr. Moore will make noise of the piano there. And I will tell you stories of things that have happened to me, people I have met, and drinks that I have consumed. And since I mentioned that, I'm kind of going to start with that. The thing is, if I repeat a story I told last year, I deeply apologize and I beg the indulgence of the audience because I don't actually remember the stories I told last year. It's all a blur because I was having so much fun here at Joe Press. But I am indeed the chairman of Anthrocon and we have uh, several hotels in the city of Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh as the Germans say, in uh, Pennsylvania in the United States. And as the chairman, my job is to rent a big truck and ship all of the stuff up from my home state of North Carolina, which is where the stupid people are, up to Pennsylvania, which is where the furries are. Okay, there's some Americans out there, they got that, I can tell. It is a long trip, it takes about nine hours, 
And usually when I get there, I am exhausted, and all I want to do is go to the bar. Our flagship hotel, within the past couple of years, had a change. You know, the winds of change blew across the hotel. There was a magnificent five-star restaurant known as the original Fish Market Restaurant. They had a wine list that was 18 pages long. And I could simply go down the wine list, and when I arrived, all the staff knew, I would say, mm, I would like uh, any of these 30, just bring one of them. Let's see, surprise. The original Fish Market restaurant is no longer there. This five-star Michelin rated restaurant has been replaced with a restaurant called Bill's Burgers. <laughs> it's a nice restaurant. But Bill's Burgers has a wine paragraph. <laughs> and I arrived, this was their first year, they had just opened. And I went in there with my logistics crew, I call them the stuff crew because they move the stuff, you see? <clears throat> and I sat down, I was looking at the wine paragraph, and I was disappointed. However, the saving grace was the first wine on the list. Everyone knows, who knows me, that my absolute favorite wine in the world comes from the magnificent country of Germany we're in right now. Specifically the Mosel Valley. This thing, Osmoseland, is the greatest in the world and that's what I will always go for. And I looked and they had a magnificent Riesling, specifically a cabinet. For those of you who are not wineophiles, a cabinet wine means wine that is so good you keep it in a cabinet so nobody else can get to it, specifically your mother. <laughs> and I saw that on there. It said, Riesling Cabinet Mosul. And I said, ah, how lovely. And the waiter came over and all the guys saw that I was happy. After nine hours, I get my Mosul land Riesling. And I said, hello. Like this one, this one here, the Riesling, the Riesling from Germany. Give me this one, give me this one right here. And he said, Oh, we're out of that. We won't have any till next week. Everyone at the table just reached up and grabbed the silverware and dragged it back away from me. And I looked up at the man and said, Do you know who I am? And he said, why? Did you forget? <laughs> I'll have to give him that one. So, okay, I'm a comic. I'm a funny man. So the next day, when we had the pre-convention meeting at the hotel... Now, my pre-convention meeting is not just the hotel. It's eight hotels, a convention center, the city of Pittsburgh, the mayor's office, the tourism bureau. It's a very big meeting. And we sat down at a huge table, and I sat down at the front, and I wanted to make a joke. And I sat down, and I said, ladies and gentlemen, I will have you know that when I arrived last night, there was no Riesling in the bar. And everyone at the table said, <gasps> They turned and looked at the beverage manager of the hotel. <laughs> That was last year. That was 2015. This year was 2016. Funny how that works. When I went to the hotel, I met up with some of my logistics crew and they were kind of smiling and giggling. And I said, okay, what's so funny? And they said, we got here before you did? You should have seen the manager of the restaurant. He came up to us and he said, is Dr. Conway here? <laughs> they said, no, he's not here yet. The man said, could you tell him we have his wine? <laughs> it's good to be me sometimes. <laughs> As I said, however, it is my job to rent a truck and to, uh, uh, Laurie, as the British people say, yes? And to put all the stuff into it. Now, when you rent a truck, 
You go to a truck rental place or a lorry rental place and you say, give me a truck and you take off. It's supposed to be easy. I had done this before. I went to the same rental place and I called them and said, I want a panel truck for cargo. And they said, sure. And I arrived on the given day. This was also 2015. I arrived. And I went inside and said, I am here for the Anthrocon cargo truck. And they said, it's right outside, sir. I said, thank you. And I went outside. Excuse me, um, I, I, I don't see it. Where, where is it out there? It's, it's right out in the parking lot, sir. You, you can't miss it. Okay. Miss, excuse me, I, I don't mean to seem dim, but I, I, I don't see it out there. She said, it's the second one in, sir, and it's the second one. That's yours. I said, okay. If you don't want that, you're going to have to get a full-size truck, which will cost you double. <clears throat> I didn't want to pay that, so I said, all right, I'll take the Tonka toy here. So I went on and got the truck, and I put it in my pocket, and I went back inside, <laughs> and I gave the lady my credit card, and I went outside, and I, got, I kind of squeezed myself into the truck, <clears throat> and I was thinking, I have a lot of equipment. Is it going to fit in this? So, I started to make alternative plans. The equipment that's not packed solidly, I'll put in this. Maybe the equipment that's in solid boxes, I can ship down there. Because I don't have time to make alternative plans. This is the day before the convention. And I was driving along, and I stopped at a red light. We do that in my country when the lights are And I know some of you are Eastern European, but anyway. And some of you are Italian. Anyway, I was... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I would say that. Because I'm from Philadelphia, there's more Italians in Philadelphia than there are in Rome, believe me. And I stopped at the red light, and I was looking in the rear of the mirror, and the mirror, in the inside, the mirror had a thing that said, objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. And I said, they couldn't possibly be. Because I'm looking at the rear doors. And while I was stuck, I reached back and my fingers touched the back doors of the truck. No, 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 this is not, no, this is not going to work. So I got on my phone and I called and I said, look lady, this truck is not going to work. I'm going to bring it back. I don't care what you have to give me. I don't care what I have to pay. I'm bringing the truck back right now. Give me whatever is available. He's good, isn't he? <laughs> we didn't rehearse this, by the way, this is all off the cuff. So I drove back in. It was a cloudy day. And when I drove in, a small break appeared in the clouds. And a singular shaft of golden light shone down on this massive, four meter long Dodge cargo van that had not been there before. Inside and I said, oh, hey, hey, the Dodge van out there, is that promise to anyone? And she said, no, sir, it isn't. Well, give it to me! She said, I can't. Why? It's not clean. <laughs> Out there, you may think the convention just happens. You had no idea. 
what goes on behind the scenes, how much work, how much blood, sweat, tears, and more blood goes into making when this convention's work. So I will ask you a personal favor. When you leave here tonight and you're out there having fun, when you see somebody with the staff lanyards, the red and orange and the security lanyards, please thank them because they are suffering terribly so that you can have a good time. There's your guilt trip for the evening. Grab myself some of this. A couple of a uh, couple of weeks ago, I was at a convention in uh, in England, which is not where he's from. Don't make that mistake; I will hit you. I made it once, once. Yes, that, that's that's not a dueling scar. Anyway, that was from a broken Guinness bottle. <laughs> A year ago, I was invited to be a guest at, of all things, an anime convention. You all understand anime, that's the Japanese animation fandom. That's not at all furry. They said, would you come to our convention? And I said, really? You want me to go there as a guest? They said, yes, we want you to be a guest because we've never had a furry guest. We want you to be our furry guest. I said, okay, sure. Now, I'm in the business, I understand how these things work. You have the guests, and then you have, you know, the guests. We call it the A-list and the B-list. I knew that in anime fan, no, I'm not an A-list guest because they had these luminary voice actors. People who are, oh, we do the, you know, what's his, Naruto and all, we do the voices for that. And then we have this fat old yank who drinks. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> it, it's like a reflex, you can't stop. So, um, I went to their webpage, and this was really driven home, because when you went to the webpage, on the front page it said, amazing voice actor number one, and amazing voice actor number two, our guests, and that's all it said. If you went to the guest page, it was amazing voice actor number one, amazing, amazing voice actor number two, and if you scroll down to the bottom, oh, and some drunken old yank who drinks <laughs> under the fold. But that's okay. That's all right. I understand. I'm going to fight it. <laughs> My forehead itches. Oh, boy. <laughs> When I arrived, oh, they told me it was going to be in Sunderland, in England. And I looked up Sunderland. It's very, it's on the east coast of England. And it's all the way up north. It's almost Scotland. As a matter of fact, it would have been Scotland, but there's some history going on there. And it's on the beach. I said, oh boy, I get to go to a convention on the beach in June. So I, I packed my suntan oil and my, my beach umbrella and my, my flip-flops and my speedos. And I was all ready. I arrived, and I was picked up, I was picked up by one of their senior staff members, <clears throat> and I immediately felt sympathy for the boy, because I saw the look in his eyes. This one, he got up from the chair and he looked like this. Like the walking dead. <laughs> when he looked at me, he didn't look at me, he was looking through me at some mystic eldritch horror that lurked in the shadows that only he could see. This boy had seen a lot and immediately I felt kinship with him. And he took my bags and as we were walking away he said a strange thing. He said, you're in luck. One of the guests has canceled so you're not going to have to sleep with the staff. I said, excuse me? And he got the look on his face. You've probably seen the look. The look on his face said, oh my God, did I say that out loud? <laughs> he said, oh, just, 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 we're going to take you to the hotel now. That's what we'll do. Okay. 
Okay. So he drove to the hotel, and he, he, gave, he gave him a lovely, lovely, nice hotel room, which apparently was destined for one of the great guests. But since he canceled, they just had me. So I got the room. But remember, I'm, I understand, I'm not their A-list. So he left and I immediately, I unpacked my, my beach towel and my, my umbrella and my flip flops and my speedo and I ran outside and I went onto the beach and I said, wow, beaches in England are nothing like California. We don't have as many icebergs. And I've never seen a Viking longboat in California. So I kind of went back inside before I got frostbite, <laughs> and I, 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 you know, you know, I left the speedo on because I kind of like that. But I put my regular clothes on, and I went to the con site. As your friends used to do, you had like the hotel here, the con site. You had to go a little distance to get to. So I walked to the con site, and I'm looking around, and I found my my friend who picked me up, and I said, "Okay, what do you need me to do?" And he looked at me and he said. Everything. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't follow what he mean. He said, we had one guest here for Friday, Saturday. It was Friday. And we had the second guest. He's coming tomorrow, Saturday and Sunday. With the other guest canceled, you're all we have. And I said, oh, how sweet that I'm here to help you in your moment of desperation. But what do you need me to do? He said, whatever you do. I said, I got you covered. <laughs> I said, make with the glass. And he did. They put me up on a big stage like this, and they had this huge room this size, and there were like the eight furries at the convention oh, sitting there. So I just started doing what I do. I started putting this in my face and started having noise come out. Within an hour, the room was full. I think I did something right. I had a good time, and the convention folks seemed to like me. The next day, Saturday, dawn bright and clear, and I got up and I went to the con site, and the exact same staff member met me with a look on his face like this. <laughs> And I said, uh oh, <laughs> what happened? He said, the other guest canceled. <laughs> You're it. I said, so I'm the guest. <laughs> he said, yeah. I said, you know what to do, boy. <laughs> I got it covered. <laughs> I think I must have done something right because when I went home to America on Monday, I felt very good. And on Wednesday, I had an invitation to come back the next year, and this time I was on the front page. <laughs> Excuse me for a second. Fox, take over. I gotta see what this idiot wants. Okay, um, so a couple of years ago I went to this pretty cool studio called Abbey Road. Um, it looks like it might be going back pretty soon. So I have a new video for you guys. And uh, uh, Uncle Paggy has very kindly let me hijack his story over for like 4 minutes and 30 seconds or something. So without further ado, I'm gonna play this amazing video that Easy Wolf worked on. Um, Let's hope it plays. <laughs> Just beyond the surface of our world lies an undiscovered country, always changing, treacherous and beautiful. When we slumber and slip through the walls we built around us, when we wash onto unfamiliar shores and step into the wild, the paths ahead can carry us toward our future or trap us in tangled destinies and lives. 
Close your eyes and listen. Hear the music. Soft and distant, like a beacon in the dark. A dream catcher guiding you through feathers and twine to where you belong. Before you ask, I did not start my howl when that bull came right up to me. Oh my god. <laughs>
Thank you so much. So yeah, uh, the Dreamcatcher is going to be my next studio album. There'll be more information out about it uh, next month. Um, huge thank you uh, to Easy World, to Tom, to Stuart, to everyone that was involved in the making of the video. A huge thank you to Tim Russ, who some of you might know as uh, Star Trek Voyager's Tumalock. He did the voice acting over that first. Uh, he was an amazing person. He was such a joy to work with. Thank you, Tim, if you ever see this. Thank you so much. <laughs> I would say thank you. They didn't tell me what that was going to be about. They just said that the guy over here is going to distract you. I am in... Is Easy Wolf out there by chance? Yep. You are? Dude, stand up. Let people see you. Holy mother of crap. Wave your arms. Musicians on our fandom. That would, is anybody else have an erection other than me? <laughs> you? Yeah, I know how you feel. Jeez, I'm 51 years old. This is the first time in 12 years. I'm gonna treasure while I can. Okay? Where were we? Oh, I was making no. Oh, I was making noises with my face while they're getting that ready. Oh God, what am I gonna do now? More noise. I'll see what I can do. mentioned that um, that recent trip that I had, there was a little bit of something that happened ahead of time. You know, there, there are a lot of things about Uncle Kage that a bunch of you probably do not know. Little secrets I'll let you in on. Little things, first off, are you aware that well, I have a doctorate in chemistry, I'm a successful scientist, but I am the grandson of an American hobo. My grandfather was indeed a hobo, a tramp, he rode the rails. And another secret, when I was very, very young, there was some damage to my teeth. What you see here are actually caps on the teeth. They're made of porcelain. They don't cause me any problem. The only thing is I have to brush with toilet cleaner. But other than that, <laughs> one of them broke off two days before I was to go to Sunny Khan. And my smile suddenly had this horrible, snarly, snaggletooth gap in it. And I frantically called my dentist. And I said, I need an appointment. I need to have this fixed. You gotta help me, please, please, please. And the dentist said, well, okay, come in, come in tomorrow morning. This is 24 hours before leaving. I went into his office and said, what's the problem? I said, I am traveling internationally. I'm going to be performing overseas. And I cannot perform with my teeth looking like hell like this. This is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen. You need to fix it for me. He said, where are you going? I said, England. <laughs> And he said, anyway, <laughs> let's change the subject. Let's, let's talk about the other end of the world, shall we? I also get invited to a wonderful convention that's down in Australia. It's called Convergence, and it is magnificent. I love Convergence. It is, first off, in January, which is summertime down there. They put on a good show. Pete Smith, the man in charge, he's like the little brother I never had. I like to beat up on him. But <laughs> the thing about Australia that makes it really interesting is that everything in Australia wants you dead. <laughs> everything. I mean, the flora, the fauna. What does Australia have the rest of the world doesn't have? Box jellyfish, funnel web spiders, land sharks, drop bears. Everything in that country wants to kill you! And that's cool. <laughs> See, because I come from the United States where there's a gun pointed at me all the time, I'm used to it. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't make that joke over here. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> oh, I have a headache. Good heavens, I'll just hold my white glass up here. <laughs> I was there in Australia, and they had a beautiful, beautiful consite that was on a green bluff overlooking the Yarra River outside of Melbourne. Now, the Yarra is, they make fun of the Yarra because in its past it was a polluted river, but I thought it was beautiful. 
I thought it was very picturesque. So being a tourist, I wanted to go down there. I got out my, 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 my what do you call it? Your handy over here, they call it, right? I had to get that thing, so I had to get this, which is stuck on my belt, and it's really growing in the store. There we go, okay. So I got the thing out, and I'm like, oh boy, I'm gonna take pictures of the Yara. And I went there, there was a long set of wooden stairs that led down to the water. Not a problem, I'm gonna go down this long set of wooden stairs, and I walked down the long set of wooden stairs all the way down to this wonderful water that was oozing its way slowly to the Pacific Ocean. And I got down there, and uh, I'm looking around, I said, okay, I can't even picture this, I can't even picture that. Typical tourist stuff. So I got, I uh, like practically filled my phone with pictures. And when I turned to go back up, the railing, the wooden railing, had a piece of paper that was attached to it with wire. And the piece of paper had written on it the words, WARNING! A one-meter tiger snake is living under the stairs. They are deadly. It is territorial. It will stand its ground. And I said, oh, how nice to tell me. It would have been nicer if you put this warning at the top of the stairs before I came down here to where it is. So I went back up the stairs kind of like this. Saw a stick. <laughs> no, just a stick. And I made it to the top of the stairs. And I reminded myself that everything in Australia wants to kill you. So I dodged a bullet. That's an American expression. I saw I dodged that bullet that day. I had a lot of fun at convergence. Did anybody go to my first furry convention panel like this year or in the past? Uh, yeah. Remember how I warn you about something called con crud? Even when you are careful, even when you have your hand sanitizer, which I have in my pocket here, one can still catch con crud. I was there until Monday. It was the Sunday of the convention in the morning where I felt it creeping up on me. Within three hours, I was running a fever. It must have been 39 degrees Celsius fever. I was feeling dizzy. I couldn't swallow. I could hardly speak. And I still had three panels and an auction to do that day. We have an expression in show business, the show must go on. I was sitting backstage and I was perspiring and I thought, I, I don't know, how am I going to make through this? And Pete came back and he said, Yeah, mate, you're all right. Which in Australian is, Excuse me, my good friend, are you feeling okay? And I said, Dude, everything in your country is trying to kill me, even the air. And he said, All right, no worries, mate. Which in Australia means, Anything you wanted to, actually. It's like a catch-all term. So I, I finished, I finished my panels and I finished the auction. My voice sounded like, like croaking a frog. I managed to get through the auction. I knew that I could barely walk and I just told people, I'm going to my room, I'm sorry. I went to my room, it was five in the afternoon, 1700 for your Europeans, and I just fell into bed and I slept around the clock thinking that with a good night's sleep, I would defeat the Australian plague. It didn't work that way. I woke up the next morning feeling worse. And now I had to get on a trans-Pacific airplane flight that was going to take me 21 hours across the ocean to the United States. Surely sitting on the plane and being nice and still and resting will make me feel better. It didn't. I arrived in Los Angeles, my clothing looked like I had fallen into a swimming pool. I mean, it was dripping with perspiration. I knew that my face was flushed deep red, and I wasn't being very steady when I walked. I was kind of walking like this, 
dragging my suitcase behind me, and sometimes walking backwards even. And um, I went into the immigration area, and they had a giant sign that said, if you are showing any signs of illness whatsoever, you must report to a health inspector. I said, uh-oh. <laughs> See, I know what they're worried about. They're worried about Ebola. I know I don't have, I don't think I have. No, I knew I didn't have Ebola. I had the Australian plague. That's not going to start a pandemic in my country. So I figure, I'll just be cool about it. I'll just walk through here and nobody will notice that I'm drenched in perspiration and bleeding from the eyeballs and walking like a zombie. The fever was so high, I thought I was going to set off one of the fire detectors. But if I play it cool, nobody will notice. Somebody notice. An American immigration inspector came up and said, Excuse me, sir. You don't look well. Are you feeling all right? This is where it's useful to be a comedian because you can think quickly. And I said, No, I don't feel well at all. Listen, my boy, you're still young. You can learn. Don't ever try to match one drink for one drink with Australian Marines. You will lose. <laughs> I to a little more closely and I said, is there anything in that waste basket? Could you kick it over here? I think I'm going to need it. He said, move along, sir. Move along, please. <laughs> So I was congratulating myself. <laughs> I got through that, didn't I? Aren't I clever? And it was when I was telling this story to some friends of mine who are in the military, and they said, you do know that Australia doesn't have Marines, right? <laughs> the stupid one. <laughs> I sometimes wonder if I'm getting too old for this. I used to be able to do like three hours on stage without getting tired, but I'm starting to feel worn out. When you get old, it sucks. Just remember that. You will start to feel different. Your mind will start acting differently. You'll accept the chairmanship of furry conventions. We have something, I, I, maybe in, in your home language you have a phrase that describes what in English we call a senior moment. When you do something that you would expect of somebody who is 98 years old and almost dead. When you get to be my age, you find yourself having senior moments. I remember my first one. I'll take you back in time. To my first senior moment. I woke up in the morning, and I was going to have breakfast, typical American breakfast, uh, cereal with milk. So I took out a bowl, and I put it on the countertop, and I poured the cereal into it. I was going to pour the cereal into it, that is, I'm sorry. And I went to get the, the, uh, the milk out of the refrigerator. And when I opened the refrigerator, the box of cereal was in the refrigerator. <laughs> I said, that's very strange putting that in there. And what's stranger is I don't see the milk. <laughs> That 
doesn't happen to young people. It does suck getting old, believe me. Not only that, but you start to find that society starts to act differently. Odd, that. It's like you woke up in an alien world. For example, if I am on a bus, and I'm seated in a chair on a bus, and an elderly lady gets on the bus, I will stand up and I will ask the elderly lady to sit in my chair. If I'm on an airplane and someone else is struggling to put their carry-on bag in the overhead, I will stand up and say, last me up, please, and I will help them put the carry-on in there. And everyone around me looks at me like I'm Mother Teresa. Oh, that's amazing. I can't believe you did that! Really? I don't know. Some people have said, oh, Uncle Kage is pretentious. He just does that because he is a pretentious old American guy. I don't think so. When I was young, we used to call it manners. And it counted for something. Apparently it doesn't anymore. Or maybe it does. If a single one of you in the next few months is sitting on the tram and an elderly lady gets onto the tram and you stand up and give her your seat, I will consider my purpose fulfilled. supposed to stop. I know what time we were supposed to start! What time are we supposed to stop? This is called Uncle Kage's Story Hour, with Fox and Moore's assistance, but I don't think we had the full hour. I'll throw some stuff on the end. How about? Is that okay? I got some older stories I can tell. And I think I will, just for the hell of it. Because I realized that I've been doing this story hour for longer than some of you sons of bitches have been alive. <laughs> so some of you were not even on this planet when I first told some of my stories. Am I bitter? Yes! <laughs> Don't get old, it sucks. <laughs> American comic George Bush once was... <laughs> I'm sorry, I meant George Burns. How could I make that mistake? <laughs> so what I did there, didn't I? <clears throat> American comic George Burns once was asked when he was my age or older, what is sex like at your age, Mr. Burns? And he said, it's like playing pool with a rope. <laughs> Some of them got it. <laughs> so you don't ever want to get old, believe me. But sometimes with the passage of time, there can come rewards. We're going to take them back in time, strangely enough, to the 1980s. if I remember correctly. My old friend Neil, who has since passed away. That'll happen too when you get old. My friend Neil and I, uh, we were young teenagers. We used to go every single Friday with our meager earnings from our summer jobs. We would go to first what we called the cultural literature store. Today you call it a comic book store, but we didn't want our parents to know where we were going. So we would go to the cultural literature store and we'd buy some cultural literature in four colors. And then we would go a couple of doors down to a store, a bookstore called Jean's Books, run by a gentleman named Jean. 
Jean's Books was a staple in the area. And boy, we must have been doing that four or five years without fail. Every Friday, we would get our comic book, our cultural literature, and then we would go to Jean's Books and we would buy the larger literature, science fiction stories. The stories of Isaac Asimov, of Larry Niven, who's a jackass, but that's another story. Um, and uh, we've been doing this for years. And one day, one of the checkout cashiers came up to me and she said, you'd better be careful. I said, why, are there spiders in here? She said, no. Jean doesn't trust you. I said, but, but, but we, we come in here every single Friday. We almost always buy books from him. She said, he thinks you're stealing from him. I said, well, that's ridiculous. We're his most loyal customers. Every single Friday we come in and we buy some of his books. She said, but you come in with bags from another store. This is not making sense. I'm sorry. I, I, I appreciate your concern, but this is just ridiculous. We we go to the coming the cultural literature store first, and then we come here. Thank you for your concern, but I think it's not warranted. About ten minutes later, here came Jean, this tall, gangly, ugly guy with four noses. He came up. I made that part up actually. Not being ugly. So um. <laughs> He came up and he said, excuse me, can I look inside that bag you're carrying? My bag from the cultural literature store. And I said, why would you like to look inside my bag, sir? He said, I would just like to see what's inside. And I said, really? I see a lady over here who also has a bag. Are you going to look in her bag as well? And he said, no, just yours. I said, is that so? Very well. Please look inside. He looked inside. He fished through the cultural literature. He was in there. He handed it back to me and I said, Are you satisfied? He said, Yes. I said, Thank you very much. Neil, drop what you got. We're leaving. And we walked out. And we never again walked into that store. Because if you're going to treat your best loyal customers that way, you do not deserve their custom. In my book, which is written in American English, that makes you a motherfucker, okay? <laughs> 23 years later, I got a long memory. 23 years later, I was back in my old hometown. And I was in the same shopping center and I was with a new friend that I had met in school years ago and she was visiting the area and I was showing her the area. And we happened to look up and it was still there. The cultural literature store was long gone, but it was still there. There was the sign, Jean's Books. And I said to my companion, say, let me tell you a story about Jean's Books. Now, where the cultural literature store used to be, there was a Starbucks, of course. And there was a gentleman sitting at the Starbucks, and he was sipping coffee and reading a newspaper. When I said that, he looked at me and said, Oh yes, Jean's Books, that's the finest bookstore in the East Coast of the United States. And I said, Oh, I beg to differ, sir. And he said, Oh? And I said, Yes, let me tell you a story. Now, I don't know what it is about me, but when I start to tell stories, crowds start to form. <laughs> so I started telling the story of what happened between my friend Neil, the loyal customer, the late friend Neil, and this horrible, dreadful man, Gene, and the crowd
did. And I jumped off the chair and I quickly grabbed that companion and said, we have to go now, let's go, let's go, let's go, we have to leave, we have to leave. And she said, why are you in such a hurry? And I said, the guy with the coffee? That was Gene! <laughs> fuck with Uncle Kage. <laughs> that felt good. That felt almost masturbatory good. I liked doing that. I don't know if he's still in business and you know what? I don't care. Probably shouldn't keep these people too much longer because I'm sure there's something that's going to be going on in this room at some point and we want to give them time to set up so it starts on time. But I do want to end with a, a small observance. Some of you perhaps did not hear the news. And if that's the case, then I'm very sorry to tell you. There is, for the first time at Euroference in 10 years, an empty seat in the audience. My dear father, Grandpa Kage, that some of you, many of you met, passed away, I'm sad to say. He died on the 25th of January this year. Very suddenly, it was a terrible shock to the family. <clears throat> and I, I think a lot about him. He was a man from a different time, from a different generation, but he was nonetheless a furry. And this was driven home in a such a powerful way when my dear and sainted mother was packing to come to Euroference and she was getting things out she wanted to bring and she opened one of the drawers of my late father's dresser and all of his Euroference badges and all of his lanyards were neatly laid in that drawer. He had kept them all these years and she started to cry and I had to go and come. I, I could tell lots of stories about my father. They're sometimes hard for me. My father was a working man. He was a man that worked his entire life. And it was difficult for him when age caught up and he could no longer work. It didn't stop him, though. One of the reasons that my mother and father moved to the state of North Carolina, which is a very temperate state, from Pennsylvania, which is a very cold state, <coughs> was there was a terrible snowfall, and my father, who was not well, he required oxygen to breathe, he was not very strong, looked outside at the snow, and dragging his oxygen tank, went over and started to put on his hat and coat. And my mother said, what are you doing? And he said, I'm going to go shovel the snow. And my mother said, no, you are not. In your condition, you're not going to do that. Absolutely, I forbid it. You will not. Get that hat off. Sit back down. So my father angrily sat back down in his chair and he sulked. And he waited until my mother went upstairs to take her shower. She came downstairs from taking her shower and saw my father outside with his oxygen tank in one hand and the snow shovel in the other hand shoveling the snow. That's when they decided they had to move to a warmer climate. But that's the kind of man my father was. As I said, he was a working man. <clears throat> After he died, there were some duties that a son has to perform. I've always maintained that you know, a son does have these responsibilities to his father. One of them is a legal responsibility that the deceased person has to be formally identified. Somebody has to go and say, yes, this was my father. I couldn't place that responsibility on my mother or my sisters. That's something a son has to do. So I went to the funeral home and I introduced myself. And they very quietly took me to a little room off to the side. And they opened the doors and there was a coffin there, and I saw my father lying in the coffin, very still, motionless. 
he did look very much like he was asleep. And I took a deep breath, and I walked up to the coffin, and I, I braced myself. And I looked down at him, and I said, Selfie! <laughs> Of course I didn't, that's a lie. But it made you laugh, didn't it? And that's okay. My father was at his happiest when the people around him were happy. He liked to hear other people laugh, and he did his best through his life to make that happen. And of the very many gifts that my father granted to me, that's the one that I cherish the most. And I thank you for allowing me to share it with you tonight. again thank you. Um, in a very short time there is going to be an improvisational workshop that is going to be given by a very very old friend of mine, the artist formerly known as Prismo. He has asked me to join him and I said no I'm sorry I can't but I was sober when I said that and I'm not sober now so I'm going to go join him with that. So if you want to go to the improv panel I recommend it. And after that if you want to go to the charity booth in the lobby just go. You'll see. Thank you once again, ladies and gentlemen.